mighty Mississippi, the father of waters, begins as a modest stream. Native people say it begins with a drop of water from the beak of a bird high in a tree. Winter snow and summer rain and springs bubbling up out of the ground all flow together and create what is known as the headwaters. Wildlife is abundant. The river traces a serpentine path with many twists and turns. The headwaters are beautiful and peaceful nature's great and holy cathedral. For generations, people have been drawn to this waterway. The river has drawn explorers like Henry Schoolcraft, who identified the source of the Mississippi River at Lake Itasca. It has drawn entrepreneurs who logged the verdant forest and indigenous peoples were drawn by an ancient prophecy to these holy waters, waters that has sustained their way of life for thousands of years. So when we talk about the headwaters, you know, it's very important for us as Ojibwe people because it not only rep represents our food supply with fishing and, and manoomen, our prophecy was that when we uh, followed this megas shell, through different areas of the riverway and then into Lake Superior and then finally over here, it was told that we would be well established in a land where the food grows on the water and that is here in this region. For scientists, the headwaters are a living laboratory. When I think of the Upper Mississippi, I think of all the ways that both people and, and wildlife, all the biodiversity around us connect on these transitions between land and water. I think of a meandering, connected, um, gradual transition and all the species that need both land and water during different parts of their life. So I find there's just so much more to discover and figure out in all the complexity of the, the river. One thing that I, I love about the, the river is that it's like a main street for America because it connects us um, all along the, the continent, north to south. As soon as I think of the Mississippi, I think of my childhood growing up on it, fishing, boating, swimming. As a scientist now today, it's that appreciation built from when I was a little kid um, to also understanding how interesting this place is from a scientific perspective, that we have this sort of natural sandbox to build models for how these rivers evolve through time. It becomes incredibly important when you start thinking about modern environmental issues. The Mississippi River has meant a lot to me. I'm Dave Ellingson, the Paddle Pilgrim. I love the outdoors and paddling my kayak as I explore the natural world. About 10 years ago, I paddled over 2,000 miles on my Huck Finn adventure on the Mississippi, down America's Main Street to New Orleans, and I saw how the river was a flyway for millions of birds, a home for hundreds of varieties of fish, a highway for billions of dollars in commerce, and a source of inspiration. For our team of adventure paddlers, Jim Lewis, Ellen McDonough, and me. A return to the headwaters was a homecoming for good friends. Each of us has paddled the entire Mississippi, but we heard the call to return to our favorite stretch of the river, to savor the scenery, enjoy the wildlife, and renew our spirits. All adventurers, especially paddlers, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Our plan was to launch in early June to avoid midsummer heat, humidity, and mosquitoes. <laughs> it's always great to meet fellow paddlers, 
And as we started out, we ran into two guys canoeing the headwaters. We wished them well, but then heard something no paddler wants to hear. A canoe scraping bottom, low water, a not so subtle hint of what was ahead. We decided to start further downstream on several large lakes. The skies were blue and sun bright, and we launched near Bemidji. But it was getting warm out. No, it was hot, 100 degrees hot. On the water, it was bearable. But once we stopped to camp, the heat and the bugs were overpowering. Three high temperature records were set in the Twin Cities this week, and hundreds of records were toppled statewide. Simply put, it's been the warmest start to June in Minnesota history. So the summer of 2021 was no joke. As you look at the rates of warming, not, o not only since you know the beginning of the 20th century or since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but even in just the last 50 years or so, some of the fastest warming rates are in the northern parts of Minnesota, and that includes the Headwaters region. But we kept going. One of the parts I love best in our adventures together is setting up camp and sitting around eating and swapping tales. Ellen would complain that our laughing often made her stomach hurt. Well, when we got into our respective tents that night, we were, we were really hot. As I laid um, sweating in a pool of sweat, uh, I felt this cool breeze coming in from around me when actually there was no breeze in sight outside. The mosquitoes were fanning me in my tent. I was actually grateful to be fanned by mosquitoes. So I guess it wasn't all bad. We paddled on. You could almost see the water level going down. The boat launches we used to get out of our kayaks were now almost five feet above the water. We paddled long hours looking for uh, access to the shore where we could set up a tent or, or whatever. Uh, to uh, get relief from the heat. And uh, what I learned was don't trust David to hold the boat. We, we'd been in the, in the kayak for hours, so my legs were kind of, kind of wobbly. So I asked David to pull up beside me and, and stabilize my kayak while I got out. And as I was getting out uh, and I realized that I was, my legs were, were widening as doing some sort of circus maneuver and David was nowhere near me. He was out in the middle of the river. He drifted away, he didn't say a word. Growing up here, I don't honestly recall seeing what I saw in the summer of 2021, where I saw waterfalls completely dry that have, as long as I've known them, have been flowing. Uh, I, I saw um, rivers at record low levels. Probably we're going to see things like this into the future. Going in early June, you should have had optimal water conditions um, and you had really terrible water conditions. And my guess is that whatever flow you saw was groundwater, it wasn't even from the surface. Um, and I think that's a climate change issue. As outdoor adventurers, we were experiencing firsthand climate change. And this journey confirmed what scientists have predicted. As the water level kept falling, we were witnessing in real time a mini Grand Canyon being sculpted in mud banks, exposing holes where muskrats and otters and beavers once lived. I wrote in my journal one evening, the whole creation is groaning. The natural world is suffering. We paddlers were tough and had even paddled the fjords of Norway together. But this was a different story. Our spirits were sagging and we wondered if we should hang up our paddles. But the river 
the land, the trees were suffering too. The headwaters had called us to return, and it felt like they were trying to tell us something and become our teacher. As I lay sweating in my tent one night, a song written by a paddler musician friend played in my mind. The lyrics kept echoing. I can't help but think this river has more So much more wisdom than I knows what it's supposed to do Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that too The river just flows The river just goes On our journey I had met a nine-year-old Ojibwe girl named Naomi As we stood together by the river near Palisade, she pointed across the water to where all the trees had been cut down for an oil pipeline. She asked me, where will the animals live? Naomi is part of a group called the Water Protectors, who are trying to stop the Enbridge oil pipeline. This pipeline crisscrosses the region and poses a major environmental threat to Ojibwe tribal lands and waters. The goal of the water protectors is to protect, protest, and pray. Naomi and the water protector children had created posters, which encourage us to listen to the animals and make their voices heard to protect their homes. Native peoples, are joining the growing chorus of voices to honor treaties, protect the water and land, and care for creation. There are some that I know who are Ojibwe women in the area, and they are, they're from the area around Grand Rapids. And what happens with them is every Sunday, they get together and they sing songs and they put out their tobacco and they pray for the river. We still stand here today protecting our lands protecting our waterways. We do this because we have a spiritual investment in all that is around us and we offer our prayers to our Mother Earth because that's who we are as Ojibwe people. We understand who we are in the universe with our our feet planted firmly on the ground and our hands in the air. We are the people who connect all lands and skies here in our Earth realm. I remember an Ojibwe prayer. Grandfather, sacred one, teach us love, compassion, and honor, that we may heal the earth and heal each other. Protecting the earth can take many forms, such as through public policy. The state of Minnesota has led the way through its clean water, land, and legacy amendment to the state constitution that uses a small percentage of the sales tax to protect, enhance, and restore Minnesota's lakes, rivers, streams, and groundwater. The Mississippi and the rivers that flow through it, the landscapes that are here, are incredibly beautiful places, but they're also incredibly sort of delicate places, and I think If we're conscientious and we are ambitious enough to think about how to live within them in this sort of symbiotic relationship, um, we can preserve those landscapes and the waters themselves uh, for generations. And we, we need to be proactive about it. I'm optimistic about Minnesota because of what Minnesotans believe in general and what they're doing already. I guess my little contribution to try and ease some of these problems uh, are that, I, you know, my family, we try to buy new as infrequently as possible. 
and to purchase, when possible, used goods, things that don't require manufacturing. I also ride a bicycle to work whenever I can, including in the winter. Personally, I, I'm trying to fly less, and so I want to use the recreation opportunities, the chances to enjoy nature closer to home rather than flying to exotic places. And so I, I really um, come to appreciate the chance to connect with nature right within a bike ride from home. I think if I can do the same sort of thing my father did, which was take me to these places, show me these places, and get me to understand and appreciate what they are and why they're important. If I can at least do that with my kids, I would feel very good about being a good dad. <laughs> but I want them to have the experience I did, right? Uh, growing up fishing and swimming and boating. I want them to have that experience because through that, I think they'll appreciate how beautiful these places really are, especially the Mississippi and, and what that means for this entire region. For Jim, Ellen, and me, our headwaters paddle was eye-opening. This was the main street of America. Much needs to be done. But as individuals and together, we can make a difference. The Mississippi headwaters are a classroom and a cathedral. The bells are ringing and calling us to action to care for the Father of Waters and Mother Earth. First of all, we just have to start talking about it. Talk to your friends and neighbors and vote Become a water protector where you live. Involve your children. Go down to the river and pray. Our actions will all add up. Like the drop of water from the beak of a bird high in a tree that falls and grows into the mighty Mississippi. Roll on, mighty waters. Just flow